Praise the Lord. Praise God. Amen. Well, it's always a blessing. You can keep coming and bringing offerings. Praise God. I can filibuster while we... <laughs> All right. It's always um, good to be in the house of God with the people of God. Today is going to be a good day, that Amen. breakthrough. To, to, it feels like a victory. Somewhere in the air, I can... I can just hear. Hail to the victor, shall you hail to the victor. Hail, hail, hail to the ship. Okay, I'm sorry. I just, can you feel it in the air? Praise God. <laughs> oh, okay. <clears throat> All right. I pray that you brought a Bible with you on today. Amen. You're going to need a Bible <laughs> because we really want to break open the the word of life on today, I believe um, I have a word for you from the Lord. Um, there are sermon notes and outlines around here somewhere. Um, if you didn't get them, then it's okay. I mean, they've got some. I think Laverne is armed and dangerous back there in the back. <laughs> and so if you want a set of notes, we have some um, for you. I always like to put things in people's hands so that they can try the spirit and see whether or not it be of God. You always want, oh, I felt that, <laughs> you want to make sure that um, what you're hearing is the word of God. I invite you to get your own concordance, your own um, Bible apps. I have several of them that allow me to travel deep into the word of God and break open the word of life and find the, the morsels that are hidden in the text. And I invite you to do the same thing. And um, years ago, I had the opportunity when I was living in Florida and was attending the Carpenter's Home Church. They used to have a spiritual warfare conference every year. And um, um, I remember people um, coming in. Um, one of them was um, the Reverend Dr. Fuchsia Pickett who used to be a Methodist pastor back in the day till she got filled with the Holy Ghost and they threw her out. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. <laughs> they did. <laughs> but one thing about Dr. Pickett that I loved is she was a wonderful expositor of the word and she put together all kinds of outlines and notes and I really was mentored um, um, by her in those days through her materials and she would always say this material is copyrighted you copy it you have the right to use it praise God all right so same thing with these notes bless God all right um, I have been um, you know going through my process that I go through um, a man but this one started at least two weeks ago um, because it's an interesting time and season, and um, there are some things that um, have been laid upon um, our hearts that we want to endeavor to speak to, and so I wanted to do so with, with wisdom and from the heart of God. And so if you have a Bible, if you would open it um, to Ephesians chapter 5, that's just one of the first places that we're going to go. Ephesians chapter 5. And um, then, of course, we're going to start in verse uh, number 6 and read a few verses. And then we're going to um, jump over to Ephesians chapter 6 and start at verse 10 and go down. So I'm going to pray first and then so that when we get into the Word, we'll just go straight through, okay? So, Father... Thank you today. Thank you for this sacred task. Thank you for these, your people. Holy Spirit, we invite you to um, open our minds to understand the word and open our hearts to receive an impartation from that word. I invite you, Lord, to think through my thoughts and to speak through my words, to just have your way on today. 
And you know, Lord, I pray that that angel that you told me about, the angel with the golden flask filled with the oil of revelation, I pray that he would move throughout this room, pouring out revelation fresh over the hearts of your people today, that they would leave here thinking, wow, I get it now. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise God. This is uh, the English Standard Version, starting in Ephesians uh, chapter 5, verse 6. And I was, I was wrestling with um, how to approach um, what for many people is a controversial um, topic. You know, folk get all um, um, up in arms when you talk about politics or religion. <laughs> you know, people, people get upset when you, when you do that. So I didn't want to really do that. I wanted to um, uh, see what was really on the heart of God in this season because if you, if, you, if you turn on the news, there are days that by the time I get ready uh, to go to bed, I'm like, Lord, there's so much going on in, in the world. Now, it would just be good if you would just come back today. I mean, now would be a really good time, you know. It seems almost as if people um, across the world are losing their mind. Um, you look at um, elected officials and regardless of party affiliation and it seems as if they are all losing their minds. Like, Lord, what in the world is going on? What is to be uh, the response of those of us who bear the name Christian, you know, believer? And so I, as, as I wrestled, um, with what to say today, I, I was going to go to Ephesians chapter 6, which we're going to get to, but the Lord said, push me back a few verses and said, no, I want you to start right here. So this is Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus, and he's dealing with all kinds of issues that was going on in this particular um, church, and he talks about, you know, walking with God, being an imitator of God, walk in love. He, he begins to deal with, you know, sexual immorality and those types of things. And then when you get to verse 6, he says, let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, because of all these things, these things, this stuff that's going on in the earth today, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them, for at one time you were, you were past tense, darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. So walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. Come on, some stuff just ain't hard, you know? And try to discern, try, try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Here we go, verse 11. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. That word means it is made manifest. You can see it. Shine light on it. You can see it. See, for anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, See, but understand what the will of the Lord is, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes, the wiles, the methods of the devil. 
You have to remember that. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So now, what does all that mean? We can read it, but what does it really mean? So I, like, I was thinking about this as I was putting this, I was like, Lord, okay, maybe, you know, maybe it's just me. Maybe they're not really interested in, you know, what's inside these words, you know. But I was thinking, you know, because spring is coming and all the little critters running around in the, in the neighborhood and, you know, the ones that dig little holes in your yard because you like to give them nuts and so they, you give them nuts and then they bury the nuts in your yard. You know, and so those little critters, you know, call squirrels. And I was thinking, you know, if you give a squirrel a pecan, he cracks it open before he eats it. Okay, it was just a thought. Okay, he doesn't just bite down on <laughs> the hard nut. You give him a walnut, he cracks it open before he eats it. So we're going to crack this open. <laughs> okay. All right, so if you look at Ephesians chapter 5, just indulge me. Just, just indulge me if this is not your thing for, for just a minute. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 11, where it says, take no part, no part, take no part. That word in the Greek, sugkoinoneo, it means to co-participate, do not co-participate in. It means to communicate, to have fellowship with, to be a partaker of. So, so it's take no part in the unfruitful, that's a word that means barren, barren, the unfruitful works of works, the works, the deeds, the labor, the business, the employment, I thought that was interesting, that which anyone is occupied with, enterprises, undertakings, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, skotos, shady stuff that folk do. Isn't that good? The shadiness, the ignorance, ignorance respecting divine things and human duties, the accompanying ungodliness and immorality, the darkness, that together with their consequent misery in hell, persons in whom darkness becomes visible and holds sway. Another key word in that, in that passage is the word expose, expose. It means, I, I like this, that word. When you think of expose, you know, we just think of maybe like, you know, showing something. No, the word means convict, rebuke, repu reprove, bring it to the light, call to account. That's good. Show one's fault. What you talking about? You don't get to judge me. <laughs> I don't know what book, what book people read. You know, they pull stuff out of the, the, the Beatitudes. Bible say, judge not lest ye be judged. You know, that's talking about condemning people to hell, the word in the Greek. You can't tell them, go to hell. You might like to, but you can't tell them that. <laughs> you know. <laughs> but when it comes to discerning things, there's another word that's translated as judgment, which means to discern. You need to have some discernment, and you can do that. You can elgeko, convict, rebuke, reprove, bring to the light, call to account, show one his faults, demand an explanation. How did that get in the book? How did that get in there? Okay, okay, we got to keep going. And then, so it says, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them for it. It's shameful even to speak of what they do in, in secret. But when anything is exposed, the light becomes visible. Okay. And so then you drop down to verse 15. Look carefully then how you walk. Peripateo. Be careful how you live. Walk is, is a Hebraic, Hebraism for how you live, how you regulate your life, how you conduct yourself. You know, so you don't walk as unwise. That word means foolish. Okay. I, I, don't, I, I don't like that word. It's in the book. <laughs> now, don't walk as unwise, but walk as wise. Why? So false, skilled people, learned people, for people who know how to form the best plans and use the best means for their execution. And see, it says making the best use of time. That word is a Greek word that means to redeem. That's why some translations will say redeem the time. Make wise and sacred use of every opportunity, whether you're going to the supermarket or to the polls. Okay. For doing good. 
You know, it says, it says finally, in, in Ephesians 6, be strong in dunamo, empowered, increase in strength. You know, increase in strength and in the strength of his might, the Lord's might. Why? Put on your clothes. Don't come outside naked. Put on the armor of God. Why? So you may be able to stand. You may be able to stand. Why? Because we're not wrestling with each other. We're not wrestling, you know, uh, Democrats against Republicans, black against white, you know, Jew against Muslim, uh, Christian against Jew against Muslim. That's not what we're wrestling with. That, that's not the real fight. It says, for we, we do not wrestle with flesh and blood, see, but against the rulers, the arche, the principalities, the, the sphere of angels and demons, <laughs> we wrestle against rulers, against the exousia, the authorities, the delegated influences, the powers of rule that set up replicas of their, of their dark governments in the earth, the cosmic powers, see, the cosmocrator, the world rulers, that's a, it can be a reference to the devil and his demons himself. This present darkness, the skotos, there it is again, the shady stuff that goes on. The spiritual forces of evil, that's pneumaticos, is where we get the word supernatural. Supernatural, pneumaticos poneria, supernatural depravity manifest in the earth. Okay. <laughs> and so listen, so, so, I, I, so then I put it together and I try to hear it prophetically. What is God saying in Ephesians 5? What is, what is he saying? So here it is. Here's the amplification looking at the definitions. Do not participate in nor have fellowship with the unfruitful deeds and undertakings of darkness that produce barrenness. Do not partake of enterprises or businesses, the labors and employment of ungodliness and immorality. Do not co-participate with persons, agencies, institutions, legislators, government officials, preachers, teachers, him, her, this, that, persons in whom darkness has become visible and holds sway, but instead call them to account. Bring to the light. Aren't you glad you came to church today? Praise God. You know, bring to the light their thoughts and demand and explanation. Reprove and rebu rebuke them. And while you're doing it, look very carefully at how you live. Examine how you are regulating your life and conducting your own self. Don't be foolish. Instead, be wise. Form the best plans and the best means for carrying them out. Dr. Joy DeGruy would say, be the healing. Be the healing. Recognize that the days are evil, so redeem your time. Make wise and sacred use of every opportunity for doing good. Be the healing. Increase in strength. Be made strong. Be made strong in the Lord Jesus Christ. Fellowship with him, birth strength and might. So be clothed in him, his heart, his mind, his word, his will, his ways. That's what a disciple is. Why? Because we are not wrestling with, with, with we're not struggling against flesh and blood. Look deeper, look deeper, look deeper. Gaze past what seems natural and instead look into the realm of the spirit and see what is really happening. Amen. Our battle, our battle, our warfare is not between you and me. It's really against dark, fallen, angelic spirits, the principalities and rulers, the fallen little G-O-D-S of time and eternity. Our real battle is against fallen angelic authorities and delegated powers with influence in the earth, the devil himself and his demonic host. Theirs is the influence that fuels this present darkness. Theirs is the impetus behind all ungodliness, 
all immorality and the accompanying moral degradation. Theirs is the power between, behind social political forces that legislate systemic evil clothed in good darkness that has become defiantly visible. Come on, people. Come on, people. There is a gross dark. See, Isaiah got it right. He said, arise and shine for your light has come and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. He says, darkness covers the earth and even gross darkness, the people, but the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. And so we do all this fussing and arguing, you know, division and separation because we have not understood what we're doing, why we're doing it, and who we're really fighting with. So the Lord said, take them behind the scenes and show them what's really going on. So journey with me today out of this natural realm past flesh and blood, race and religion. Let's look behind the scenes and discover the root. That's the word that, uh, where'd my prophetic friend go? She back in there somewhere. About, oh, there she go. That's the word that Robin was getting about the root. Let's discover the root structures that have given rise to this present darkness. The Lord said, expose it to the light. And in so doing, that's what we'll do. We'll expose it to the light. So in order to do that, we have to go back to the genesis of things. You have to just indulge me for a few minutes. We got to go back to Genesis. Go back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. The Lord began to actually give me these things years ago, years ago, when I was asking him, how is it possible, how is it possible that a person could be born again and still be addicted? How could a person be born again and abort their child? How could a person be born again and be an alcoholic or, or addicted to pornography. How could a person be born again? I had stuff in my own life I was dealing with. I said, Lord, I need to understand it. And the Lord gave me this revelation about the salvation of the soul. Darkness exposed to the light. The salvation of the soul. And he brought it back to my memory. So we have to, this is, I'm going to show you what he showed me. Okay? And, so, and really, I, I'm not going to apologize if it messes with your Sunday school theology. Okay, you're going to have to track with me today. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1 tells us that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And man, I could, I could teach a whole class on that one verse. Because the Hebrew is a three-dimensional language. You know, it had, each letter has a letter, a letter meaning. It has a picture a paleographic pictorial meaning and it has a numeric meaning so if we had time which we don't I could show you how in the first verse of Genesis in the Hebrew Bereshit bara Elohim you know in the beginning God created you know the heavens hearts and the earth the Hashemayim Haaretz, you know. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If you look at it and magnify it pictorially, you'll see that the very first verse in Genesis tells you that the Son of God would come and be slain for the sins of the earth. So don't let nobody tell you the Bible isn't the word of God. Genesis 1.1 tells us that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This sacred book is consistent in revealing to us the fact that the creator of all things is God. If we follow the narrative of scripture, here a little, there a little, line upon line, precept upon precept, we discover that all things came into being through the word of God. That's John's voice. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, life, and life, come on, that's not hard. And life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. 
John 1.14 says, And the word clothed itself in a panoply of flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son of God, from the Father, full of grace and truth. So back in Genesis, the living logos, the living word of God, is Jesus Christ our Lord. In the beginning was the Word. In the beginning, God, the Word, created the heaven. The Word, let me, let me go up this bunny trail for a minute because the scripture says that, that um, uh, the Word in Mark 4, the Word is the seed. Let's put that on the board. The Word is the seed. In the beginning, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was God. The Word was with God. In the beginning, God, the Word, Elohim, created the heavens and the earth. See? And so, listen. When he, be, when he does this, Psalm 33, I need you to get this, verses 6 and 9, says he spoke and it was because he's God. <laughs> See? So, Psalm 33, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made and all their hosts by the breath of his mouth. He opened his mouth and the universe <laughs> came into manifestation. Look at that, verse 9 in Psalm 33. He spoke and it was done. Just that, he commanded, it stood fast. Just like that. There was no confusion. There was no chaos. Only order. 1 Corinthians 14 and 33 says, God is not the author of confusion. Deuteronomy 32 and verse 4, his work is perfect. Ecclesiastes 3 and verse 11, he has made everything beautiful. And yet in Genesis 1 and verse 2, it says, the earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the spirit of God was in the birthing position over the face of the waters. Well, what's going on there? The verse tells us the earth was a formless void. Those words in the Hebrew, tohu, formless, bohu, void. Darkness over the face of the deep. The prophet Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 45 and verse 18, says, For the, thus says the Lord who created the heavens, who is God, who formed the earth and made it, who established it, he did not create it in vain. That's the Hebrew word tohu, which means a desolation without form, a waste, a wilderness, vain. God did not create it desolate, waste, a, a waste, wasteland, a wilderness, who formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Deuteronomy 32 and verse 4 says, His work is perfect. That's the sacrificial word, tamim. I mean, his work is without blemish. His work is complete, perfect, whole, and not bohu. That word means an undistinguishable ruin. How could the earth be a formless void, a, a wasteful, undistinguishable ruin when we know that scripture says when you take it here a little there line upon line precept upon precept says that God doesn't create tohu bohu he speaks and it is the clue is found in the text well the clue is in the words tohu and bohu because God doesn't create like that but it's also in the word was the earth was Hebrew haya it literally means became if you have a good study Bible your Bible will have a little reference mark and then it'll have little reference notes somewhere on the page that tells you this word could be translated as became so a better translation of verse 2 is the earth became a formless void, a desolate ruin, an undistinguishable waste and darkness. That's the Hebrew word kosek. It means misery, destruction, ignorance, sorrow, wickedness, obscurity. Covered the face of the deep. That's a Hebrew word that means the abyss. Come on. That's, if, if I had music, the sound effects would be getting really intense right about now. <laughs> see. Another thing you have to see is that in Scripture, the obscuring of the sun 
And the consequent darkness that follows is always a sign of judgment. So something, something, something catastrophic occurred between in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And then all of a sudden, well not all of a sudden, it could have been who knows how many years passed. Something catastrophic occurred. Now, this is what your Sunday school teacher didn't tell you, see. <laughs> Here's what I believe and many scholars believe happened. A ruling angel, one of the Lord's own creations, led a revolt against the Most High God. His name was Lucifer. He had um, a kingdom authority and a domain over which he was responsible in his service to God. In Ezekiel 28, the Bible tells us, starting at verse 11, tells us that Lucifer was referred to as the king of Tyre. References here in verses 11 through 19 could not possibly be referring to an earthly man. He is described in this passage as having been perfect, full of wisdom, beautiful. He was fine, in other words, in his appearance. Verse 13 says, he was in the garden of God. That's interesting. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And there was a garden in Eden that Lucifer and his angels frequented often and, you know, took no doubt great delight in before the earth froze over. <laughs> okay, I'll have time. I'll tell you. Precious stones were his covering, which were prepared for him the day he was created. And in him were the pipes and the instruments and the music for worship. That's why he hates it. He was an anointed cherub that covered the throne of God with worship. Blameless in his ways until iniquity, sinful thoughts, desires, which led to action, was found in him. He became filled with violence and sin and God cast him down down his heart cast him down turn the lights out everything froze he sat on a lump of ice for eons probably his heart was lifted up he had become proud because of his beauty always taking selfies <laughs> Isaiah 14 Verses 12 through 15 gives us added insight as to what occurred between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2 to bring the judgment of darkness in the earth. Lucifer, day star, king of Tyre, son of the morning, fell from heaven. He was cast down when he attempted to exalt himself above God. Isaiah 14, verse 12. His arrogance and pride weakened the angelic nations over which he had rule and charge when he influenced them against God. God. He said in his heart, in his thoughts, in his imaginations, in his thoughts, in his, the seeds, in his, in, his, in his mind, you know, he said, I, I'm going to, I will exalt my throne above the throne of God. I will sit upon the mount of assembly in the far north of the universe. I will ascend to the tops of the clouds. How you like me now? I will be like or I will make myself like the most high. And so Lucifer's attempt to usurp the reign and authority and worship of God results in him being cast down to the depths of Sheol. Lucifer, the beautiful angel of God, having been obscured and perverted and transfigured by pride, becomes the Ha Satan, Satan, in his fall. In scripture, a change in name reflects a change in character. He goes from the beautiful anointed cherub, Lucifer, to the Ha Satan, the adversary or accuser. Jesus says, I saw Satan fall faster than lightning. What was he thinking? The kingdom he ruled was weakened. 
The angels that participated with him on the revolt were judged and cast down also. So the cause of the formless void and chaos and ultimate darkness of Genesis 1, 2 was the judgment of God against the Hasatan and his demonic host which revolted with him. So I would suggest to you that what has commonly been called and taught in Sunday school classes as the creation is really a recreation, a reconstruction out of the formless void and chaos left after Lucifer's revolt. Therefore, in Genesis 1, beginning at verse 3 and and following, it depicts God pushing the reset button pushes the reset button. Now you have to get this because we're going somewhere. Only this time God took a man and a woman created in his image, clothed in his glory and placed them in the garden and told them to replenish the earth. That's another clue in the text. If I take this bottle and drink it all the way down to here and then I say, hey, can can you replenish this for me? That's not hard. It implies there was something there prior to. Okay, the same word is used in reference to Noah when him and his family come out of the earth, out of the ark. God says, replenish the earth. Okay, and so God's creation is now said to be good as it was spoken into existence. But when the man and the woman were added, everything is, oh, that's, that's, that's very good. Very good. In Genesis 1 and verse 28, God, Elohim, creator of the universe, gives the first blessing recorded in scripture to Adam, his ha'adam, the ha'adam, the man and the woman, they, man, they, man, man, male and female are told to be fruitful, to multiply, to replenish, to subdue or master and have dominion over the earth. They, Adam, the man and the woman, reflect divine knowledge and insight. Adam, the man and the woman, are both naked. They look like two CrossFit Games athletes. (laughs) At least in my mind, they do. (laughs) And yet they know no shame because they are clothed in the glory of God and they have unbroken fellowship with him. God their father, because of his grace and love, hands over to them the key of dominion in the earth and he tells them to rule and reign, be fruitful and multiply. He gives them all the earth's beauty, its gold, its provision and choices of what they might have in order that they might exercise free will but you and I peering into the spirit realm walking with the man and the woman through this garden paradise we must not forget that Satan having been cast out of heaven but not destroyed only limited and restrained as to his access he is in and is the cause of spiritual and moral darkness and depravity so you have to remember that after the chaos which left darkness on the earth God does not remove the obscurity of darkness but instead just go back to the beginning of Genesis chapter um, verse 1 chapter 1 verse 3 and following what God does is he flips the switch and restores the light of his glory calling it back into existence. Then he separates the glory kingdom light from spiritual darkness. This is not just day and night. This is a spiritual parallel, um, spiritual light, glory, revelation, truth is removed from spiritual darkness, moral depravity, and rebellion. Because if you check Genesis, you'll see he created the, the moon and the star later. So what kind of light is this? Come on, people. So you have to remember this. Satan is no longer the anointed cherub that covered worship, nor does he still possess his original perfection. He is and has become fallen. I think it's uh, uh, Dr. Tim Sheets that causes him the forever loser. Yeah, he's fallen. (laughs) He's evil at the core. 
This displaced angel whose pride caused him to want to be God, to be worshipped and have supreme authority is kicked out of heaven and relegated to a place of darkness. And now in this earth and garden paradise, God had the unmitigated goal to place the Adam, the Adam clothed in his glory and made in his image. And to them, he gave Lord's mastery over the earth, prosperity, blessing, dominion. This is very important. Dominion means sovereignty. He gave them undisputed political power, supreme authority, the right to possess. The man and woman now possess what Satan longed for. He hates them. In addition, they walk clothed in God's glory. They have intimate communion. They walk with the Lord in the cool of the day. If you read the Genesis narrative, they have access to heaven and earth's vast resources. They are his beloved creation, his family. See, they, his, his family. <sighs> Listen to the conversation in the councils of darkness. Let's lean your ear in and listen as the enemy seethes with anger and jealousy and envy and utter corruption. Hear him as he says, how I hate them. How can I take that which God loves and cause it to become that which God despises? How can I provoke a conflict between the Godhead and his beloved creation? How can I destroy them? How can I, how can I destroy them? I will distract. I'll cause them to shift their focus from the Lord and instead believe and entertain and intimately embrace a lie. This will usurp and make void their dominion and authority. I will use a seed. I'll use, I'll, I'll use a word. I'll use seeds. I'll use, I'll use words. I'll use thoughts. I'll use imaginations that give birth to concepts that give birth to precepts and laws void of God's truth. I'll, 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 I'll use a seed, I'll use a word that gives birth to lies and error and rebellion and perversion, evil, which separates them from the kingdom of God. I will use a seed, words, thoughts that in, ultimately become their actions. And so if you look again at the text in Genesis chapter 3, Flip over to Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Journey into the garden. And there we will find the serpent who lends himself to the enemy. Two trees, the man and a woman. And through the serpent, Satan engages the woman in dialogue. Why? Because women like to talk. <laughs> That's not hard. He engages the woman. Little girl babies use a whole lot more words than little boy babies. They talk all day. He used words, thought-provoking questions, and visual senses, the imagination of the heart to lure the woman away from the light in her soul, away from the trust and confidence of God's word and into the darkness of doubt and despair. Did God really say? The woman shifting her focus from God, see, she, she sees that the forbidden fruit is good for food. It's a delight to the eye. She was checking it out. She was thinking about it. He was, she was thinking, it's desired to make one wise. Where'd that come from? Thoughts, impressions from the enemy. She is deceived, distracted. The fruit, if eaten, breaks God's command. It breaks his heart, and it results in judgment. Having allowed the seed of a lie to reach the depths of the imagination, the woman is lured or seduced by deception into opening the door, and she crosses the threshold into darkness, dining with destruction itself. She eats and then gives some to her husband who was with her the whole time. He was with her. I had a man in my church years ago got so mad at me, he wanted to fight. Because for years he had been telling people that the woman ate the fruit and prepared it and brought it to her husband that he didn't know where she got it from. 
And he ate him like, who told you that? What broke down non-Bible studying pastor told you something that stupid? The Bible says he was with her the whole time. She didn't sneak that fruit in on him. The man, her husband, her source, her protector, he witnessed the exchange. Come on now, you got to get this. He saw it. What have you been witnessing? He witnessed the exchange. He heard the dialogue. He knew the deception. He saw her rebellious feeding upon the seed, and he does nothing to stop the transgression. He knows the command of God. He knows the word of God, and yet he sins willfully. First, the 2 and verse 14, in case you think I'm making that up. The lure, the seed, the bait of Satan for the woman was deceit and trickery. He appealed to her visual appetite and he deceived her. Go ahead, go ahead and buy those. You look good in those little pants. That's five sizes too small for you. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> he, her visual appetite. You think, I, does my butt look good? Does my butt look big in this? Oh no, yes. But he deceived her. Pride is masculine. Okay, come, okay, come on back, come on back. We, we went somewhere. Pride was masked as, as wisdom. And the woman was fooled into thinking she needed to be like God. You have to get this. She was fooled into thinking that she needed to eat the fruit to be like God when she was already like God, created in his image and clothed in his glory. The lure, the bait, the seed of Satan for the man was idolatry. He loved her. Remember when he first saw her? He could hardly talk. Hey, hey, woo, ha! Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah. This bait for the man was idolatry. He loved his wife. He was one with her. And so in choosing to eat the fruit, he places her before the word, the command, the seed of God, and she becomes his idol. He sees the sin. He knows it's wrong. We see stuff. We know it's wrong. But we allow our love for this or that to, to cause us to shake hands with what we know is wrong. God is relegated to a lower place. I got to go faster. As the man's love for his wife was exalted above his love for God, they were both distracted from the truth and from their purpose and destiny. And spiritual death, which never means a cessation of existence, spiritual death, which is separation from God, occurs. The glory lifts, and now in darkness they see their nakedness because they are no longer clothed in him. And the seed of sin and death enter the world. Dominion shifts, and a kingdom realm of darkness is established. A stronghold of darkness in the earth. In Genesis 3 and verse 15 you will notice that even in the judgment of God, there is a prophetic word concerning salvation because God is love. And so even in the judgment of God, there was hope. And here the gospel is prophesied or proclaimed. And the Lord says, I will put enmity between you and the woman between your seed and her seed. So we know that's prophetic because the woman doesn't carry the seed. She has the egg. So the seed of the woman is the Messiah. Okay. I will put enmity, Aba, to be an enemy, to be hostile, to treat as an enemy, to hate. I will put in enmity between your seed Zerah, your fruit, your seed, the stuff you give birth to, and her seed, the Messiah. In other words, there will be a natural hostility between Satan and the woman 
a natural hostility between Satan and the woman, between the serpent's seed, the serpent's ideology, his words, his treacherous fruit, and the seed of the woman, because the woman's seed, the living word of God, the truth of the word of God, the Messiah, the truth, will crush Satan's head. So come on, let's, let's peel the curtains back, and let's peer again into the spirit realm and see the battle. See the seed war. Listen in on the conversation taking place in the councils of darkness. And in my imagination, my prophetic imagination, I, I, I see Satan calling a meeting. This is after the fall. After the fall, he calls a meeting of his chief princes, his generals, the rulers of darkness, the spiritual wickedness in high places and all their, their hordes. And he says, listen to me, guys, listen. And let's listen in as he tells them. He says, listen, I have found their weakness. They are easily distracted. Simply appeal to their flesh. Glory has lifted and they are vulnerable. He uses words. Listen to their, their, their flesh. He, he used use words to get them in every form, thoughts, pictures. Find their personal weaknesses. Defile their imaginations. Plant perverse, poisonous seed that will birth destruction and desecrate their bodily temples deceive them so they don't know their potential or destiny in him, the true seed that brings redemption. He calls for prince hatred. Hatred comes forth. Plant seeds of disgust for one another in their minds. Water the seeds with loathing for that which is different from them. Water the seeds with a strong dislike for anybody who looks different from them. Divide them along the, the lines of race and culture. Hatred. Create an aversion and strong revulsion for one another based on skin tone. And then even go into cultures and divide them based on skin tone and hair texture and socioeconomic conditions. Hatred. Completely redefine love. Cause them to think that to love means to tolerate, instead to call to obedience to their God. He calls for the prince perversion and false identity. Perversion, prince perversion, and your buddy false identity. Plant seeds of corruption. So distort and twist their sexual identity that they become a caricature of God's original intent. Distort and malign masculinity and clothe it in femininity. Distort the beauty of femininity and clothe it in masculinity. Rape them, torment them, wound them, destroy men, women, boys, girls. Take seeds and confuse them. Start in the womb. So they'll go around saying, I was born like this and it'll be true. Distract them to such a degree that they are willing to butcher their bodies, the temple of their bodies, transforming the outside into the opposite of their born identity. Whisper in their ears and fill their dreams with depraved sexual fantasies. Plant seeds of perversion and so radically distort God's word, God's original precept for man and woman that they will burn in lust. Man for man man, woman for woman, completely redefine, yes, completely redefine what God calls family. Tell them, they'll tell, tell, Plancy, tell them that they're lesbian or they're gay or they're bisexual, or I just like it both ways, or, or that they're transgender or transsexual, they're queer. Oh, oh, tell them they're non-binary. Just lie to them and distract them from their purpose. Let perverse seed plant the fruit of unrighteousness and work fornication, work with fornication, adultery, you too, lasciviousness, pornography, and destroy the family. 
then use their government leaders to legislate their errors. Prince of idols, you come. Plant seeds of false worship. Lure them into devotion to self, devotion to convenience, devotion to dead idols made of wood and stone. Create in their imagination little gods made in your own images. Distract them from worshiping the one true God. Plant the seeds of idolatry so deep in their cultures and government structures that they will heed and venerate the voices of government leaders and political party affiliation above the voice and counsel of God. Erase the boundaries of truth. Water down the authenticity of the scriptures and have them bow in their hearts to influences of society. Ashtoreth, Ashtoreth, work with idolatry. And the Baals, Chemosh and Molech, the twin demons of the slaughter of babies. Idol princes, generals of perversion and destruction. Distract them to such a degree that they will commit debauchery with each other, even sacrificing their own unborn children of altars of choice and destruction. So distort their thinking that they will even be willing to legislate the murder of babies born alive and call it a social service. <laughs> Cause them to so loathe all children that they will be willing to snatch them from the arms of their ethnic parents, separating them even at borders and call it justice. <laughs> Prince of division, stand tall. Sow seeds that create Rifts and discord, division, schisms, division. Erase the boundaries of truth. Cause them to fight division and destroy one another. Plant seeds that generate disunion, disharmony, dissonance. Work with Prince Hatred and create race wars. Uh, institute bigotry and racism. Legislate whole poverty districts. Inadequate facilities on every level. Make them separate according to race, culture, religion, disproportionate educational systems. Let them buy their ways, the wealthy. Okay, okay, I'll come back. Okay. Classify them according to color and age and ability and wreak havoc in the earth. Cause them to fear one another and clutch their purses tighter depending on what color the person is that approaches them. Complexion and economic disposition. Rulers of this present darkness. Spiritual wickedness in high places. Distract those who call upon his name. Cause them to lose their focus on their mission in the earth. Sow seeds in their heart of apathy and lethargy and envy and jealousy and frustration and fatigue and sickness and disease. Make fraud and deception the norms in their homes and schools and jobs and cities and governments sliding money under the table, shaking hands across the table. So blind their eyes that they lose sight of who they really are in their Messiah the seed of the woman, the Christ. Destroy their alignment with him and with each other. Distract them, distract them, distract them, distract them with social justice strategies that are void of true advocacy, true activism for the weakest in their societies. Plant seeds that will distract and destroy them and cause them to lose their soul. As you and I journey today with the people of God through the word of God, oh, we witness the seed wars. It's all through scripture. By Genesis chapter 4, Cain kills his brother Abel, jealous over a sacrifice. In Genesis 6, corruption increases in the earth. So much so that God sends a flood and destroys it all except for Noah and his family in an ark. By Genesis 11, the nations... The descendants of Noah attempt to build a tower of Babel 
corruption, despair, deception, distraction appear to prevail. Where is God? Where, where is the promised seed of the woman? In Exodus, God sends a deliverer type of Christ. Moses. In Leviticus, he gives the law. In Numbers, there are cities of refuge, types and shadows. In Deuteronomy, the Lord refines his commandments. In Joshua, the Lord sends them in to possess the promise. The seed war continues. By the time you, you glance in Judges chapter 2, you see the people turning again to worship Ashtoreth, the goddess that, the god that cause perversion and, and male cult prostitute homosexual worship. It's, it's not new. This is, there's nothing new under the sun. Dress it up differently, same demon gods. In, 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 in Kings, I'll tell you this real quick because I'm running out of time. In 1 Kings 11, now you see Solomon, Solomon, son of David. Solomon, son of David and Bathsheba, the one the Bible describes as the wisest in all the earth. But the Bible says he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. What does a man do with 1,000 women? I'll tell you what he does. The scripture says that his heart clung to the women in 1 Kings chapter 11. And he turned away from God. The older and older he got. And what's so alarming in the text is the Bible says that the Lord appeared to him twice and said, Solomon, get it together. Solomon, get it together. But his heart clung to his foreign wives who wanted temples built to Ashtoreth and Chemosh and Molech. And so what do you think happened to the babies of a thousand women? Solomon legislated idolatry that called for the sacrifice of children and allowed, and he worshiped that. Oh, it's in your book. So because he was the king, his legislation affected the nation. <laughs> but God always has a plan. By 2 Kings 23, Josiah and his reforms arise. Isn't it time for Josiah? Josiah tore down the altars, burned the bales and the ashtoreth, and reestablished the reading of the word and the worship of God in Passover. You and I must walk after the Lord and keep his commandments. Be washed in the water of the word. Be washed in the water of the word. Believe the truth. The church today, believers today, you and I have to come out of agreement. That's what we read earlier. We have to come out of agreement, out of alignment with death and perversion. We have to come out. Ha, pray. Repent and pray, repent and pray, repent and legislate the heavens with your prayers. You have the authority. The Bible says, if my people who are called according to my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal the land. Get a revelation. Turn back to the word of God, the seed of God. Hide it in your heart, Psalm 119, verse 11. Hide it in your heart that you might not sin against him. Look to him for reformation in the earth. Get a revelation. I'll tell you this and then I'm done. I was reading this week, doing my scribe Bible journal thing, and I've been in the book of Corinthians. And I came to 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 17. And I couldn't move past it. I couldn't move past it. Because I've been praying about all of this stuff that's dividing us. That's causing people to unfriend each other on Facebook. When we're supposed to be linking arms, taking hands, and bringing reformation into the earth. But instead, we receive the seed of the enemy and we see each other as enemies instead of realizing that our battle is not against each other but with flesh, with principalities and powers and rulers of darkness of this present age. And so instead of fighting with the weapons God has given us, we do other stupid stuff that brings division and that is not transformative in the earth. 
So we are distracted. We have forgotten our commission. What would happen if we really did it? What would happen if we believed in what he said? All authority has been given to me. Now go and make disciples. If we really made disciples, maybe we wouldn't need legislation to tell people what, what they should do with their children. Oh, I felt that. Man, if we been, so get this, get this, and then I'm done. First Corinthians 16, all this stuff in my mind. And it says, but he who is joined to the Lord, he who is, that's a believer, okay? He who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. And I tried to move past it, but the Lord said, no. He said, this is a mystery that the church has not understood. If we understood that we were one spirit with him. But see, because I, I always pray, I'm like, Lord, I want to be Echad, that Hebrew word, Echad, from the Shema. Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is God. The Lord is one. And I've been praying, Lord, I want to be one. Lord, I want to be Echad. I want to be, I want to be so tight, so close with you that you and I are one. And he's like, listen, silly. Listen. He says, he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit. With you have what you're asking for. But if I don't know it, then I don't conduct myself like it's true. This is a mystery that the church has not understood. So we think we have freedoms that other people have when we don't. If I'm one with him, how can I, how can I, how can I believe that the wholesale slaughter of unborn children should be a constitutional right. If I'm one spirit with him, how can I be prejudiced against my Muslim neighbors? I'm supposed to love them with the love of Christ and pray that his love in me, his compassion in me and through them, through me will be a light and a witness. Okay. Crucify distraction and get back to the great commission. And be his agent, his disciple. Be the healing. You mad about something? Be the healing. You think the community needs programs, people need help? Be the healing. What are you not using in your house? Okay, okay. Go make disciples. Go transform culture with the word of God, the seed of God, the power of God, true love of God. Represent Christ, our Savior, to a lost and dying world. And if you and I get a revelation that we are one spirit with him, we'll walk in love, real love, which is obeying the commandments of God. The Lord says, if you love me, you will Keep my, come on, I thought that was in the book. If I love you, I'm not going to tell you it's okay for you to tip and dip and slip and slide and smile. <laughs> no, repent. Okay. Okay. Lord, help us. Lord, help us. I want to close with this prayer. I pray this every day. Maybe this will help us. I want to pray it with you. Lord, open our minds that we might understand your word and clothe us with power from on high. Lord, you said whatever we bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever we loose on earth will be loosed in heaven or bind the however that goes. But Lord, by faith today, we bind our mind to your mind, and we loose vision and wisdom and revelation according to your word. We bind our eyes to your eyes, and we loose your sight, that we might see everything from your perspective. We bind our ears to your ears, and we loose prophetic hearing revelation we bind our mouth to your mouth and we loose the word of the living God in us and through us
we even bind our nose that sense that, that, that to yours that, that we might sense and discern like you. We bind our hands to your hands that we might carry your word, your power, your love into the earth, toppling demonic kingdoms and establishing the kingdom of God. We bind our heart to your heart. We are a God, one spirit with you. Let the depths of our being be bound to yours that we might follow the flow of compassion which creates encounter, which releases signs and wonders and miracles. Bind our feet to your feet that we might walk in your footsteps as true disciples of Christ. Lord, let your word be our greatest treasure and time with you our greatest delight. Then we'll be light and love and power we will transform communities. We'll see people healed and reconciled, black, white, rich, poor, Christian, converting through the love and power of Christ. Muslims, Jews, people that need a word from the Lord. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to get it, to understand that our fight is not with each other. Pick up the armor of God battle according to your word. Help us to remember our commission, our mission in the earth. Because you're coming soon and we want to be ready. We pray in the authority of the name of Jesus. Amen.